Okay, we left off last week with Gideon. Uh, the angel of the Lord had come down and was talking to him, and uh, his first response uh, basically was, um, where have you been? <laughs> uh, we've been waiting for you. Hey, I thought you were in charge. I thought you were the one that was leading everybody out of you know, captivity and setting us free, and now all of a sudden we're under um, uh, Midian uh, captivity, and uh, can you kind of give me a word of encouragement on that as to why you're letting, letting this happen? And so in verse 14, the Lord turned to him and said, go in the strength you have and save Israel out of Midian's hand. I'm not sending you. Am I, am I not sending you? But Lord Gideon asked, how can I save Israel? My clan is the weakest in Manasseh, and I am the least in my family. The Lord answered, I will be with you, and you will strike down all the Midianites together. All right. Now, there's an interesting phrase here. In verse 14, the Lord turned to him and said, Go in the strength you have. That's a little unusual. Normally, uh, we we put it together that, you know, the strength that an individual has comes from God. But that's not what he says here. He says, the strength that you have. Now, yes, I'll be with you, but you have strength. In other words, you, you are worthy of my attention. You have the ability within you to do what I need done. Now, without my help, God, God speaking, of course, God says, without my help, no, you're not going to, you wouldn't succeed, but you have strength within yourself that you obviously don't realize you have. And immediately, uh, because he said, am I not sending you? In other words, where do you think this is coming from? Do you think I do you think I didn't know the person I was picking to do the job? I know the people. I know who can do what. And I know, Gideon, you have the ability to do what I need done. Now, what does this ability Gideon have include? A trust in God. It's gonna to have to have that because that's where it comes from, but that, but he knows Gideon's got that talent, that ability, and the leadership qualities he needs to pull this idea off. Besides that, I'm sending you <clears throat> so there's nothing to worry about. To which Gideon responds with, I can't go. Sorry about that. Uh, you, you must have dialed the wrong number. Uh, I'm sorry I picked up. Uh, <laughs> because I wasn't really wanting to do anything like this. And, uh, <clears throat> and basically, uh, I don't believe in channeling, really, but, but for the sake of this illustration, I'll use it. Uh, Gideon starts channeling Moses, uh, because he sounds exactly like Moses sounds when God came to Moses and said, I want you to go talk to Pharaoh and free the Israelites from Egypt, to which Moses said, you've got to be kidding. Yeah, who, me? No way. Now, I'm going to touch on Moses just a moment, a moment, because I want to make a point that maybe you've thought of, maybe you haven't, maybe I haven't even said it in here. If I have, I forgot it, but that's, that's entirely possible. Uh, Moses says, I can't go. I can't talk good. I stutter. I, I'm, I'm tongue tied and whatever. I need somebody to talk for me. And God says, okay, okay, okay. I'll, I'll concede this one and I'll give you Aaron. So Aaron goes with Moses to do, go through the process of freeing the Israelites from Egypt. If you will look in the, in the books, in the book of uh, Exodus, 
you will find every time Aaron's name is mentioned, it's a problem. Aaron was nothing but a headache. He, he's the one that helped build, he was helping them put the uh, golden calf together. He's the one that rebelled with his, with uh, Mary and his sister. Uh, every time you turn around, Aaron is squirreling up. And I know God's going, see, that's the reason I didn't want to. I do. But we have a whole lot more trouble. If you'd have just gone and done what I told you to do, we could have skipped all this stuff because it, it wouldn't have happened. But you wanted somebody, so you got what you wanted. And when you get what you want, it doesn't necessarily eliminate God working with you, but it may be. It may add difficulty <clears throat> when you want something different from what God wants. So when God says, this is all you need, that's all you need. I mean, you, anything you add to it is going to make it, uh, make it more challenging. Because God knows exactly what is needed to accomplish whatever task he sends anyone to do. So... God, God says, well, uh, I know about all that to get in. I know who you are. I know you're the least of the least of the least of the least. And you don't have any standing and all that. But I just got to tell you, you could do it on your own. I mean, you have the, you have the ability to do it. You, don't, you didn't listen to me. I said you had the ability to do it or I wouldn't have brought it up. Uh, but I'll be with you and you will strike down the meeting nights. In other words, with my assistance, you're going to do it anyway. So you would think a normal, average, run-of-the-mill person being talked to by an angel, which doesn't happen all that often, but you know, an angel's talking to you, and you recognize, by the way, there's no question. Did you notice Gideon doesn't ever ask, who are you, or where did you come from, or wow, he acknowledges immediately who this that this individual, this personage, may it be it Christ, it may be Christ, I'm not sure, and possibly, because sometimes the angel of the Lord is is Christ. Uh, but if it's the if it is Christ, or if it's not, doesn't really matter. The personage is from God. And Gideon buys that without any problem. I mean, he doesn't have any, he doesn't raise any question. He simply starts talking to him as though it was his next door neighbor. And uh, so you would assume that, you know, getting being a smart person and ex accepting the reality that he's talking to a representative from God of some sort would go, yes, sir, well, when do I start? You know, I'm ready to go. Give me a sword. What do I need? Let's go. Get in reply. If now I have found favor in your eyes, give me a sign. That is, that it is really you talking to me. Interesting. Please do not go away until I come back and bring my offering and set it before you. Well, he's not bringing you an offering, but he's not sure who it is. Does that not seem a little strange to you? I mean, you know, I need to know who you are. I need to prove who you are. But wait a minute. I'll go get a sacrifice. I'll sacrifice before you anyway. That's a little strange. All right. And the Lord said, I will wait until you return. Gideon went in, prepared a young goat, and... Um, uh, from an uh, from an ephra flour, he made bread without yeast, putting meat in a basket and its broth in a pot. He brought them out and offered them to him under the oak. The angel of God said to him, "Take the meat and the unleavened bread, place them on the rock, and pour out the broth." And Gideon did so with the tip of the staff that was in his hand. The angel of the Lord touched the meat and the unleavened bread. Fire flared from the rock, consuming the meat and the bread. 
אני אין לו גרוע להסביר. I would guess that uh, that would be fairly good proof of who he's talking to. However, just about the time he got it figured out, he left. You know, I mean, it's like, I got, okay, I'm ready. And now, now, now the opportunity at that moment is, is not there anymore because the angel left. Uh, When Gideon realized that it was an angel of the Lord, he exclaimed, Ah, sovereign Lord, I have seen the angel of the Lord face to face. But the Lord said to him, Peace, do not be afraid. You are not going to die. Now, this is just a moment. Um, there is a myth, a well-established myth in our society. that it's really neat to be around angels. I mean, we, we've, had, we've gone through periods in our culture where we've actually almost gotten to the point of worshiping angels. We haven't quite got there yet, but we were close. And angels are fun people to be around. Because, uh, I mean, they, they, uh, they look a lot like little Joe Cartwright. <laughs> um, that's a good I mean that right off makes them worthwhile and then uh, occasionally there's a couple of them women women this time they just go around doing good things and we've had we've had TV shows we've had books we had all kinds of things come in and all these angels are just so sweet and wonderful and then if you don't believe that then look at the angels we see at Valentine's When Cupid comes around. Now these little cherubs are just sweet little, sweet little things. But the Bible, angels in the Bible aren't like that. They, they come in different forms. They come in different situations. They never, to my knowledge, they're never referred to as having uh, wings and harp and halo. Now that, that is not biblical. But they do come in different forms. Abraham uh, had a couple of angels come to him. And uh, he was unaware that they were angels. So they obviously hid their wings well. And they didn't fly in, okay? They walked. They could have flown in, but they didn't because they wanted to look like men, okay? But what I'm, what I'm saying is we have a very... Uh, we not in this room, but our society has a very strange, unbiblical, non-biblical view of angels because they're just the most wonderful things in the world. And over and over and over in scripture, people who who met with angels, who saw angels, who who dealt with angels, um, were fearful. They were afraid. They were that close to God. And the ones that were religious were that close to God, and they weren't sure they wanted to be right there. And that's where Gideon's at. He's going, I'm a lot closer than what I ever imagined being. And now what's going to happen to me? Because I could be struck dead. I mean, you know, this, I wasn't ready for such an encounter. But it's, it's very important, I think, that we understand um, the, the role of angels. One more point I will make on angels, then I will go, we'll get back to Gideon. Um, it says in Hebrews that um, Abraham entertained angels unaware. And that has been interpreted by some to mean, hey, That could mean we're dealing with angels today. You know, it could because look, Abraham, Abraham, all right, let me share this with you for your consideration. Paul, well, not Paul, the Hebrew writer, excuse me, the Hebrew writer, when he makes that statement, is not writing a, 
a treatise on angels. He's right. He's talking about hospitality when he when he writes that. His illustration of hospitality is that Abraham entertained angels unaware. He's not saying that that's a current a common practice that happened <coughs> all the time. Now it may be. I'm not going to say it isn't. Or that you can you know, I'm, I'm not in a position to make the claim that there is absolutely no way that God could, couldn't send an angel here. However, in the same writer of Hebrews says in the beginning that uh, God spoke to people through various forms, like he is here. <coughs> but now, the Hebrew writer says, now he speaks to us through his son, which is through scripture. So the purpose of angels coming would be considerably minimized at this point. Um, to say, for me to say, there's never been an angel on the face of the earth since the since Christ left, or since the apostles left. Excuse me, um, I can't say that. I don't think there has. That's my opinion. Uh, I think that was one of the things that ceased when other things ceased after the first century, in the first century. Um, I, 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 never, I never did my highway to heaven. Uh, I, I couldn't see anything but a little joke. Anyway, um, but anyhow, the point being that, that I think we don't want to get carried off into this uh, honoring angels and making it seem like God uses angels. We can pray to an angel, but we can't pray to God. Why pray to an angel for crying out loud? I mean, I got, I got the Father himself. Angel wouldn't let you do it anyway. Right. Uh, but you know, I, I don't have to deal with angels. I don't need to deal with angels. Uh, but there are people who believe that, see, because they have this view of angels that they're always sweet, kind, and loving, that they'd be much easier to talk to than God. And remember, Satan is a fallen angel. Right. And, and But remember, in other words, it follows in the same track, it follows in the same track as the uh, Catholic Church that prays through Mary because Mary's easier to talk to than God. And I'm going, why would I want to mess with Mary? Uh, I mean, you know, I've got, I've got entrance into the king. I've got entrance into the God of the universe. And I don't have to talk through an angel. Or even through uh, you know any other emissary of his other than his son. I, when we speak to God, we put it in Jesus' name because it is Jesus that takes our messages and exp expresses them to God through the Holy Spirit and so forth, uh, and says get, gets the message to God in a way that God better I guess better understands it than than I can say it. It doesn't take much. I mean. Uh, you know, I'll, I'll trip over everything, but um, I, I'm, I'm real uh, dogmatic about the, the angel thing because I, I watched our society go through angel, angelology, I guess. Uh, and I'm, I'm sure there's a better word for it, but almost the worship of angels. And then one day it disappeared. We haven't heard much about angels in the last 20 years. We went from having network TV shows about them to nothing. And I think the reason was people had the idea that well, if we, you know, these the angels were going to fix things and repair things and do godly things. And it never happened. The world didn't get better, it got worse. 
Now, I have one more point, and I'll shut up about angels. I can't resist. <laughs> Everybody knows what my favorite song in the songbook is. We're standing on holy ground. Second verse, or bad, or bad, last part of first verse, excuse me. Last part of first verse. And I know there are angels all around. How do you know that? <laughs> now, they may be. I'm not, I'm not going to say there couldn't possibly be an angel there. But when you say, I know there are angels all around, you don't. You can't. Another nail in the coffin to that song. Um, <laughs> I really despise that song. I only want I only want it sung one time. I wanted it at my funeral, and I wanted some he's standing on holy ground because at that point I planned to be. Uh, but, and the rest of you can join me later. But, <laughs> but uh, uh, that's all fine and dandy. Um, but anyway, that's my final thought of angels. We'll get back to good old Gideon here. Um, okay. <clears throat> Verse 23, but the Lord said to him, Peace, do not be afraid. You are not going to die. So get him built an altar to the Lord. There and called him, the Lord is peace. To this day it stands at Ophrah uh, of the Abazites. <clears throat> and the same night, the Lord said to him, Take, take the second bull from your father's herd. And the one seven years old, tear down your father's altar to Baal and cut down the Asherah pole beside it. Then build a proper kind of altar to the Lord your God on the top of the height, using the wood of the Asherah pole that you cut down. Uh, offer the second bull as a burnt offering. So get into a ten of his servants and did as the Lord told him. But because he was afraid, of the family and the men of the town, he did it at night rather than in the daytime. All right. So the, we have a task here for getting get in starts before he gets to all the war war machinery he'll go through. We got a, we got a task. We got to clean up the area right around Gideon. Now. Uh, Where's the best place to start? How about we start at home? <laughs> Dear old dad is a uh, idol worshiping individual. And so he tells him, he said, I want you out there and I want you to take your axe or whatever. And I want you to cut all this, cut this down and um, use the wood, use the wood for the offering that you give me. Yes, the Asherah pole. Well, when, you, when, when is this communicating to the people? I am going to burn down your God to worship my God or the God, in this case, maybe Yahweh. So Gideon does this, but but he may be a brave person, but he is not that, he's not that brave. So he says, I'll do it. God didn't put a time frame on it, which is nice for Gideon. God didn't say you got to do it before sundown. Okay, so Gideon said, "Well, better done at night when nobody's watching, um, and maybe nobody will notice in, in the morning." Well, that's not exactly what happened. But in the morning, when the men of the town got up, there was Baal's altar demolished, and the Asherah pole beside it cut down, and the second bull sacrificed. On the newly built altar, they asked each other, who did this? When they carefully investigated, they were told Gideon, son of Joash, did it. The men of the town demanded of Joash, bring out your son. He must die because he has broken down Baal's altar and cut down the ashram pole beside him. Uh, you, this is a... This is a uh, uh, death sentence kind of thing that he's done here. This is 
not just a minor crime. This is not vandalism. This is attack on bail. You would think that bail would be able to defend himself without needing the people to defend bail. And that's what, what we're going to find out. Because, but Joe asked, and this is dad, a reply to the hostile grand random. Are you going to plead Bale's cause? Yeah, what is, why, why are you defending him? Why can't Bale defend himself? Uh, are you trying to save him? Whoever fights for him shall be put to death by morning. If Baal really is a god, he can defend himself. When someone breaks down his altar, so the day, so that day, they called Gideon, drug Baal, saying, let Baal contend with him because he broke down Baal's altar. Okay. He, he makes a very good case. He says, this is a god. This is not just a human. This is a god. And if, if Baal wants his altar defended, uh, don't don't get me involved. I mean, I'm, you know, let, let Baal defend himself. He's a, he's a big boy. I mean, you know, he, uh, and he can take care of it. So uh, they put a name on Gideon. I, I guess it's to make sure that Baal doesn't lose track of which one it was that did it. Uh, because they name him, they give him a name that will remind for it, forever the people that he's the one that that Baal's out to get, or that's going to contend with Baal, because he burnt, he uh, tore down his, uh, he tore down his uh, uh, the the altar and used the Asherah pole for the fire for the wood of the fire. Uh, again. There, there is a a couple of references here that should be noted <clears throat> that um, do you remember when Elijah and the prophets of Baal were having their contest on Mount Carmel? What did what did uh, what did Elijah say about Baal then? Is your God on vacation? Yeah. Hello? I mean, hello, yeah, I'm waiting. Uh, is, he, is he having, is he riding a teacup at Disney World or what? You know, I mean, uh, where is he? Uh, I bet he's gone. I bet he's asleep. Why don't you yell louder? Which they do. And uh, then he says, well, I, I guess he's gone. I don't guess he heard you. And uh, sort, of, sort of makes fun of him or really makes fun of him. And um, then in Isaiah, uh, in chapter 40, verse 19 and following, uh, you'll recall Elijah says that people who worship uh, false gods, uh, they, uh, may, they carve an idol out of a tree and then cook food on what is left. In other words, uh, it's a tree until I make it a, a god, and then when I get hungry, I'll go back to it being a tree again, and I'll cook my food on it. And this is uh, this is God. And uh, Isaiah says, "Does this make sense? Does this make any logical sense at all? Are you thinking at all about what you're doing?" I'm a firm believer in trying to help people think. They do not have to agree with me. That's that's up to them. The agreement's not what I'm after. What I'm after is, are you thinking about anything? We live in a world that does not require thought. We are told everything and everything. We are not allowed to hear anything of a secular nature that doesn't have a person there to explain it to you. Whether it's uh, political or military or whatever, you hear this and immediately there's 25 people there to explain it to you. So you don't have to think or reason 
just listen to the man. And this is where uh, we can get into a religious problem. When we stop thinking, now we can have we can think we can be misled. We can think the wrong thing. We may need people to help us figure things out. I'm not saying that you. I'm not saying that we're all know it alls. But I'm tired of people not thinking about what they're doing when they're involved with worship, Bible class. Um, their lives in general. I don't want you to, I never, 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 never want you to ever leave one of my Bible classes without having thought about what I said. I will not intentionally mislead you. I may inadvertently do so without meaning to. That's why I want you to think. I don't want you to get to the point of Trusting me or trusting the preacher or trusting the education minister or the elders, even the elders. We're all human. We all can make mistakes. Hopefully we minimize the mistakes. Hopefully we don't make many mistakes when it comes to religion, when it comes to Christ, when it comes to God. But we can make mistakes. We can say the wrong thing. We can believe the wrong thing. I've had my thinking changed numerous times over the years on various and sundry issues that I believed was one way and learned another viewpoint and believed the second viewpoint's more accurate than the first. I don't necessarily think I was totally wrong with the first on most things, but it may not have been as accurate as it could have been <clears throat> had I included other other material that I was not aware of. So please, 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 please uh, don't ever take a person's word for what the Bible says. Study it. Check different sources. Uh, find people that you trust. Listen to them more so than the others, although they can be wrong too, but at least you've got a, a more secure uh, backing than other people. And please do that. Um, so <clears throat> Gideon is going to challenge Baal's authority for the rest of it, almost the rest of his life. And so he carries a name that basically says, this man continually challenges the God Baal. Now all the Midianites, Amalekites, and other Eastern people joined forces and crossed over the Jordan and camped in the valley of Jezreel. Then the Spirit of the Lord came upon Gideon, and he blew a trumpet, summoning the Am Amazites to follow him. He sent messengers throughout Manasseh, calling them to arms, and also Asher and Zebulun and Naphtali, so that they too uh, went up to meet them. All right. The bad guys joined forces, and uh, they come over to do battle against uh, the children of Israel. And Gideon goes through the uh, various tribes recruiting an army, pulling an army together. Um, this is interesting because he's successful. And the, his success is interesting because just uh, three or four verses back, they were ready to kill him. Uh, they had a major change of heart, or they're pretty wishy-washy, depending on how you, how you look at it. You, know, you, you don't know whether you'd want to trust these people too far, because it was just a few, a few verses back that they were ready to kill you, and now all of a sudden, they're ready to go to bat and war with you. But, but this is God's plan, and 
uh, Gideon is carrying out what God wanted him to do. So, Gideon said to God, if you will save Israel by my hand, as you have promised, look, I will place a wool fleece on the threshing floor. If there is dew only on the fleece and all the ground is dry, then I will know that you will save Israel by my hand. As you said. Gideon is a skeptic individual. I mean, you got to give him that because uh, he, he's had many, many things thrown, thrown in front of him and he keeps going, well, yeah, but... Uh, I'm not quite sure, but I'm, I'm getting there. Just help me along a little bit further. Um, and this is what happened. Gideon rose early in the next day. He squeezed the fleece and wrung it out, wrung out the dew. A bowl full of water. Now that is a lot of water uh, on his fleece. Okay? Then Gideon said to God, do not be angry with me. Let me make just one more request. <laughs> Allow me one more test with the fleece. This time, make the fleece dry and the ground covered with dew. That night, God did so. Only the fleece was dry. All the ground was wet. All the ground was covered with dew. God is a patient person. <laughs> he is very patient. Because you want to slap Gideon at this point. I mean, you know, and go, come on, fellas, get it together. How much proof do you have? And how does this work? How do these tests add to your confidence? Well, because God did what I asked for. Have you ever wanted a piece of fleece? I, I don't know what to do, God. I want, now we refer to it this way. I want a sign. Boy, if I had a sign, hey, you know, I'd be ready to go. Kind of a safe bet you're not going to get one. So that's a good way to start off uh, in case you're afraid to go do it. You can always claim that you'd do it if you saw, if you got a, a sign from God. Um, we like to know the future. We like the assurance of the future. So we want God to share with us the future. That's really what Gideon's doing here. He's saying, I know you're with me, sort of, but boy, if you could just prove it, I'd really appreciate it. So God does. And immediately, what does he do? He said, do it again. <laughs> Reverse it. Do it the other way. Let's make the ground wet and the fleece dry, and then we'll make the fleece wet and the ground dry. Okay, I don't think it's the other way around. But anyway, point being <clears throat> that even when he gets a sign from God, he's not happy. He has to have another sign. And this is what we carried over into the New Testament because you'll see the, the Jews will ask for a sign. And, and Jesus has been healing people right in front of them. And they go, well, that was good, but boy, if we had a sign from God, what, what do you want? What does it take? Well, having read these accounts, and knowing that they're true, because they're inspired by God, do you really think it'd make a difference if you got the sign from God? Do you really, or would you go, well, wait a minute. <laughs> I wasn't expecting that. <laughs> and now I don't know whether it came from God or from Satan. Can Satan do signs? I guess so. Well, how do I know it's from God? I 
I wouldn't. So I'd have to ask again. See, that's the problem. When God says, I want you to do it by faith, he means do it by faith. Faith requires us to trust God without the sign. But it sure is more comforting with that sign. My goodness, if we just knew for sure, you know, should I go east or west, God? I don't know. Give me a sign, God, please. Show me what to do. I've often thought of something, and, I, and no one's going to ever do this. Or I, I can't imagine doing it. Uh, <clears throat> You know, it, it, we have periods of time, periods in our church history, where we do things like select elders. The Bible does not say how to do that. There is no, there's no rule. There's no plan. There's no anything. It just says <clears throat> that Paul sent Timothy and he appointed them. I think that'd be a neat way to do it, but unfortunately Timothy's not around. I think that'd be the best way to do it, but Timothy's not around. So how are we going to do it? Well, we've got a, we've got a wide range of possibilities of so different ways that different congregations accomplish that task, and none of them are particularly wrong <clears throat> because the Bible doesn't say how to do it. But I often wonder, how did they pick Matthias? The, the, the apostle to replace Judas by casting lots. I'm not sure what that is, but for the for argument's sake, right now we're going to call it rolling dice. Okay, that's as close as we have to that. Would you be willing to risk God controlling the dice to roll the dice to decide whether a man should be an elder or not? Would you be doing anything wrong? Or, more likely, would you want to do the best two out of three, the best three out of five, the best four out of seven, and keep moving this on up until you, know, you get what you want or whatever? Okay, but my son, I'm serious. You know, would we be willing? To ask God, I'm, I'm not trying to do anything against God. I'm wanting him right there. But what would, you, what would you say if you saw the elders looking like they're shooting craps, but in fact they are <laughs> choosing elders or choosing missionaries or hiring a preacher or whatever? Would that scare you? Well, if that's the only thing you use to qualify them, yes. Uh, because well, you know, we're, we're going to well, well, we're going to assume you got qual. You know, you're choosing between okay, so two right. two good things here. Uh, but even at that, Ed, yeah. uh, no, I, I, I would even say that way God could control the dice to where you wouldn't put the wrong one in if God would do that. Okay. But would we have the faith to do it that way? Or do we want our control, our control brought into it of I want to have a say in how this is going to go? Interesting idea. I'm not, I'm not proposing it. I'm not saying that's the way we should do it. I'm asking, do we have enough faith to do that? I know some people that have had that kind of faith. You know, they've left things up to the flip of a coin. A major life decisions. But now they usually, they didn't just flip the coin, heads or tails. They prayed that God would answer the question via this method. So like having fleece on the ground or flipping a coin or rolling dice. You're not gambling. This is not a gamble 
because you're not saying I'm going to do, I'm going to decide this based on the best two out of three or whatever. I'm saying, God, please control what we're doing here as you once did so that your will be done. And this is one way we, we're, we're trying of trying to find out what your will is because we've got it to a point in our minds where we've got two good decisions and we two two good options and we don't know which one's the best. 